the series Pratiti Becoming Aware, a series organized by Center of Excellence in Gaming and Simulation at Sri Vaishnava Vidyapeet Vishi Vidyalaya, Indore, India. Today, we have a renowned speaker in the field of gaming and simulation, Professor Sebastian Major, Professor and Vice Dean, Division of Health Informatics and Logistics, Head of Department, Biomedical Engineering and Health Systems, KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden. Topic of this webinar is Capturing the Things We Know But Professionally Ignore. To start our event, we are honored to have with us Dr. K. N. Guru Prasad, Director of Sri Vaishnav Institute of Science at Sri Vaishnav Vidya Vidyalaya. So, I would like to invite Dr. Guru Prasad for the welcome address. Thank you, Dr. Topali. On behalf of uh, the university uh, and the Center of Excellence, I welcome uh, Professor Sebastian Major. Uh, speaker of today's uh, webinar in this series we are organizing for a long time now. Uh, I also welcome other guests who have joined from various places. Uh, Professor Sebastian, as uh, Madam introduced, works in the area of uh, biomedical engineering and uh, health system. Uh, interestingly, I find that uh, this institute combines uh, engineering sciences in uh, chemistry, biotechnology, and health systems. So uh, besides uh, speaking on uh, gaming and simulation, I would request Dr. Sebastian also to uh, briefly tell us about uh, what other kind of work is being done in this uh, institute, because uh, we also have all these active departments here uh, in our university. Uh, in addition to simulation and gaming and computer science and other engineering subjects. Uh, so I welcome the speaker once again and uh, over to you for your session. Thank you, sir, for the warm welcome. Moving on to the next, before beginning the session, I would like to introduce our speaker, Professor Sebastian Major. Professor Sebastian Major is professor in healthcare logistics Professor Sebastian is specialized in simulation, gaming, and other participatory methods to capture real-world complexity in innovation processes. He also has interest in theory of design of complex adaptive systems and the backbone of society. He is working mostly on healthcare, health prevention, and promotion systems, but equally interested in other large-scale questions. There are more than 170 publications on his name. He is also serving as head of the department for biomedical engineering and health systems, MTH, and vice dean for the School of Engineering Sciences in Chemistry, Biotechnology, and Health, CBH, KTH, Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden. So without further ado, Let's welcome Professor Sebastian Major for the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, ma'am. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gopasat, uh, for all the warm welcomes. Uh, first of all, it is great to be back. Um, uh, I was having the honor of doing this first, uh, the first talk in this uh, webinar series. Uh, and well, congratulations to S Triple uh, V to to keeping this up. It's really really valuable, and I have to say that I sometimes use the YouTube uh, recordings of this in my own lectures. So it's it's very very valuable. Um, today I put up a little bit of a challenge for myself because I'm frustrated, and my frustration comes from how smart people can do such stupid things when they become professionals. And that is where I want to uh, have a little bit of a, let's say, tickling title, capturing the things we know but professionally ignore. I hope you see my slides now. If not, please say so. Um, first of all, I'm Dutch Dutchman uh, who moved to Sweden, and here I 
found my corner and um, this corner is actually between the people that build MRI machines and the people that do measurements on uh, sports people and uh, professional sporters, uh, elite sports, uh, as well as the ergonomics people. And what I found there was that everyone talks about people about patients, about professionals that need to uh, consider keep working. And then we go back to doing something technological. And that to me is very, very strange. And if we then go to the professional world of decision making, what you see there is particularly in the public sector, here we talk about effectiveness, things need to be effective. We have all kinds of experts that work in their own domains. Um, we're steered by evaluation cycles and uh, we everything should be done based upon evidence-based practice. And all of that sounds very attractive. Sounds like we do the right things because of course you cannot make decisions if there's no evidence. That would be very strange to make a decision uh, if you don't have evidence. And for instance, in medicine, I work very much towards the, the health system these days. Um, randomized control trials are the things by which we test, for instance, medicines and intervention. And at the same time, uh, in the management literature, it's very well known that we currently are in a state of analysis paralysis, as Swartz calls it, uh, because it is very difficult to make decisions now that we have so much data uh, to rely on. So... We're, it's 2024, everyone talks about AI, uh, not the least because of ChatGPT, and I hope uh, you are finding some uses for ChatGPT in your own work. Um, but uh, this picture um, is a famous picture from Zaman. Um, they talk about the five Vs of big data, but if I read, I see six Vs. Um, <laughs> at, anyway, uh, this picture is rather famous because now all of a sudden we are sitting with such volumes and variety and velocity of data that we really need to think about, okay, how do we generate value out of that? Um, but also like, how do we still change models and how do we work with knowing that what we are uh, talking about in the data is actually trustworthy and authentic and not a model in itself? A couple of years ago, all of these things were just thinking in, into the sky. Today, everyone can relate to this because AI is so much at the forefront. So what I observe is that there is a logic in the public sector that we're going to make decisions more and more based on data. But if you actually look into, do we take decisions on data? And this is from the healthcare world. Um, what I observe is that the randomized control trials, and this is a work from a colleague of mine, Adam Darvish, um, at our university. Um, what you see is that in the whole diversity of what society is, that we take very, very small cohorts of people, very often young men, that we take as representative for, for instance, testing a medicine. Um I also observed that once you look into like, but what is actually determining the effectiveness and the safety of a particular type of medicine, then all of a sudden other things come out. You really open a Pandora's box and for instance, drug compliance, the quality of the decision-making of individual doctors, et cetera, et cetera, all suddenly start to influence. And this is where it what in the healthcare sector, we're talking about the uh, decision-making based upon uh, randomized clinical trials versus decision-making on real-world data. And then you think like, but real-world data, that must be the best. Well, actually, that's very difficult. Because if you think about what, what data is out there these days, there's enormous amounts of clinical data that, that is growing. Um, how many of you have taken your um, uh, DNA um, and sent it to some? Uh, My Heritage was one of those providers. <laughs> CB, no, like, no. <laughs> well, there are actually many people that do so. And if you go to healthcare these days, uh, maybe they do full genome sequencing on you, 
if you are uh, having certain symptoms. Um, proteomics, uh, so the protein sequencing is booming. And metabolomics, uh, everything that happens in your gut, um, all of those things are generating data now in, in amounts that previously were impossible. But what is also happening is that societal systems, citizens themselves, we produce data. How many of you have a smartwatch that measures your pulse and activities during the day? You know, well, some of you, I guess. Yes, we know <laughs> you have. Well, that means that the, um, there are all kinds of data storages about you. Uh, maybe you control them yourself, maybe not. Um, but how should we use this data? And this is your data. This is not healthcare data. We see that AI and decision support systems, they, they're really improving. Everyone's working on that. The, it's a rat race. Uh, but that also means that we suddenly start seeing a shift in like, how do we provide health? Who is responsible for healthcare? Because, for instance, you know, if your smartwatch detects that you've been sleeping badly for the past week, who is responsible for that? Is that a medical thing? Or is that uh, something for which you maybe say that your cat needs to uh, behave uh, better? Um, suddenly the models start shifting. And if we then go back to this question about what, what is reality, well, this is, of course, a little bit of a too well-known picture, but everyone describes a part of reality. Um, and we've always used data. Data uh, decision Database decision-making is not new. Basically, you could say since the secularization of society, we base ourselves to a certain extent on data. Public sector in Sweden, in particular where I live, um, but worldwide, evidence-based um, is the thing that people strive for. But if all of these experts cannot agree on what an elephant is, then what is actually this reality? How do we capture the pluriformity? And this, you, you see it coming. This is, of course, where, where games come in, because games are, are much better at that. Um, and it's a lot of steps from data to actually decisions. You need to have you need to have the data. You need to capture that. You need to have models to be able to create meaning uh, out of this data. You need to have computation information systems. You need to have well visualizations or other ways to give meaning to the data, and then all of that at the end it it turns over into actual decision making. And what you see is that when you have engineers working at all of these steps or rational decision makers, policy makers, they say like, okay, but we concentrate on this because we cannot do everything. And if you have six steps after another that are all doing reductionism because what is the priority it needs to be effective, then the question is, do we still capture at the end while we are doing the decision making, the thing that we actually had data about or even the thing that we want to discuss. This is a true blindness right now in the discussion about uh, data-driven everything, including decision-making. At the same time, society is facing a crisis. Um, now, these numbers are a little bit more from where I live, but I believe for India, a lot of the same things hold true. We have an aging population. More and more people getting older, um, and we just know, like, if you're above 75 or 80, you need more healthcare. And by the end of your life, you need more healthcare and more support. That's always been the case and will always be the case. Um, so then the question becomes, and this is in Swedish, but there you see some national prognosis about how many people do we actually have that can take care of the elderly? Well, in... Um, it is the orange line there <laughs> that is like the original scenario. Uh, and then they put all kinds of policies, like can we educate more nurses and, and uh, support nurses? But this is where we just see we cannot afford the cost by doing everything the same 
way for the aging population. So either we're not going to take care of our elderly or we're going to spend way too much, uh, too large sum of our BNP on uh, elderly care. And we need to import people from elsewhere to, to do the job. That's not going to be sustainable. And on the right hand side, what you see, and this is a global trend, mental health is deteriorating. And it's not just that we have more patients on the left that are in crisis, but this is a normal distribution. And if the normal distribution shifts, what you see is more patients, but you also see that the, the average is actually getting worse and there are fewer people that can actually thrive and uh, uh, push the system forward. So this is a, a systematic deterioration of our capability to solve things. Um, and we cannot treat ourselves out of it. Uh, because the problem is not the treatment. The problem is that there is a left shift uh, in mental health ongoing globally, very well documented. So if we, if we then limit ourselves to the healthcare system, this is actually an Indian uh, reference, uh, which I use over here as well. Um, the current scenario is very much, you have all kinds of very senior specialists, um, and you have a small uh, preventative and public uh, uh, primary health care. And that needs to flip because tertiary care is way too expensive. We cannot treat ourselves out of this. We need to push towards lower levels, cheaper levels of health care that are more provided to the masses to make sure that we keep uh, healthcare affordable, but also that we keep up the health, both mental health and physical health of our populations. And the funny thing is, I read a lot of the Indian literature here, as well as the Anglo-Saxon one and the European ones, and they all go towards the same direction. It's only the path that's a little bit in the, in the, the wording and nuances. This flipping of the pyramid is going on. Now, if you then think again, how do we make these decisions? Um, this is what is currently popular everywhere. Uh, we do it as well. Process mining, prosno prognostic analysis. You make models out of like who will need healthcare, uh, what will be needed, you have all kinds of, of data analysis. But at the same time, we say like, yeah, but it's, it's actually stakeholders that shape the system and shape the data. So how much data is there actually about a nurse knowing the patient, knowing the character of the patient? Yes, this lady, Sigrid, uh, 80 years old, she doesn't like um, uh, this type of food. She likes the other one. And if she uh, doesn't want to eat, then tell a story about her kids because that always works. Those are things that are not available in data. Maybe a little bit in a patient journal, but it's it's not structured data like we have blood tests, et cetera. And therefore they are of a different character and more difficult to deal with. What is also usually not captured in data is who actually has the mandate to do something. It's nice that we know that your blood pressure is going up, but who has the mandate? Is everything the patient? responsibility in that case we need to start supporting our elderly to be their own project manager of their health um in what way do we do this incentives are usually not documented why do people uh, do things and then we have masses of rules and regulations these are just the the letters of some of the swedish laws around data sharing um uh, in healthcare and the, up, the bottom ones, GDPR, the European Health Data Space, and the AI Act are the European ones that are coming into, and this is just a, a small selection. So for me, this the, the conclusion is that if we do AI for systems change, it's actually meaningless if you don't represent the stakeholders in the AI and data process. Um, and of course, we know that. We know that already from design theory, but it's completely forgotten in data science. Which also means that if we say that we do data analysis 
for making better decisions. We need to be aware of how our previous decisions already shaped the system in such a way that we see um, uh, its consequences in the data. The most clear one is the bottom one here, which is produced by Harsha Krishna, uh, a PhD student uh, of mine here at KTH. Um, what we did there was to have data-driven dialogues. Uh, so we made dashboards and then uh, uh, in a participatory uh, way, collected people to discuss certain topics and to identify like what their municipality should do um, for improving the mental well-being of youth between 15 and 29 years old. And we asked them previously, like, could you give us data sets that show indications of well-being to uh, uh, in this age group? And we got, for instance, this um, uh, data set about all the social reports that are uh, uh, reported into the system. They were anonymized, but we still could see like the age of a person, we could see the cause, uh, which year, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the numbers of social reports reported in one um, uh, Swedish municipality. It's not such a big municipality, therefore, the low numbers. What do we see here? We see that um, most problems occur at the age 17. If you let the data speak here at the bottom end. But is that true? Is it true that 17-year-olds have significantly more problems than 16-year-olds? And what we discover is... No, it's not true. Actually, 16-year-olds have more problems, according to experts, than 17-year-olds. But the reporting here, the Swedish school system works like that you have a, a, a school switch between 15 and 16. So the first year that the students are in their new schools, they go to gymnasium, uh, new, new school system, the teachers and others around them, they don't report any problems because we're still in a new school everyone has to adjust so we miss a lot by the way we do our designs and at the same time if you look at all the guidelines because the data says that most are coming in at 17 we make our guidelines so that we do something for 17 year olds but this is just a total miss of the fact that we designed the system such that it's not reported at 16. Another conclusion you could have here is that actually there are not that many problems for people over the age of, let's say, 19. But is that true? It's not true at all. The reporting systems for social uh, problems are very much based upon this, the basic school system in Sweden. So once people leave the school system, we don't see any reporting. So the data is shaped by the fact how we designed the system. It is not a representation of reality because the people that have problems here also have problems when they grow older. It's just simply not reported. This is quite an insight if once you start digging into the real data um, uh, that municipalities have and use for decision making. And then just to continue a little bit on that, this is uh, here on the left side, we have data about the healthcare system where you have all kinds of uh, diagnosis, suicide, uh, 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 psychosis, uh, uh, fear, uh, manic depression, regular depression, etc. And here, what you see is the time between um, uh, the moment that a person gets a referral to this healthcare, to the psych psychiatry unit, and the moment that they get their first examination. Now, the Swedish law says that everyone needs to get a first examination within 30 days. Here, the red dotted line. And if you look at the average and the standard deviation here, standard box plots, what do you see? Is this, is this healthcare system doing a good job? 
Oh, on average, yeah, it's around 30 days. A little bit over, a little bit under, but fairly good. But actually, once you start looking at the outliers, all of these dots are the outliers in the, in the data systems. Um, what you see is that there are people that are having 500 days between their uh, the moment they got referred and the first examination. And that there's a lot of people that need to wait like 100 days, 150 days. That is three to four months for a psychiatric examination. So if you just report on the average, you may not actually report on what the what is important for the system. Because once you start talking to these psychiatrists, the doctors, what they will talk about is not the patients that they see here within 30 days. What they talk about are the patients that they cannot serve, the patients that have to wait for a very long time, the patients that make it to the newspapers because they committed suicide while uh, waiting on the waiting list. So the way we design and the way we report and the way we choose our indicators influences what we see about the system. And that is not a part of data science. It is a part of another world. And what is that world? I've shown this picture before, the first time uh, I was here. Um, I still stand by it, <laughs> even two years later. For me, what we need to do within the scientific world is to start layering methods on top of each other. We should not do games that are just games and that ignore what we can do with AI and data mining. But we need to design games that are built upon simulations and those simulations that are built upon um, AI and data mining in a way where we use the methods for what they're good at. And of course, this is not so strange, but you don't see many studies where we where we layer these on top of each other. Um, games are superb when it comes to the act of complexity, the way the agency, uh, who has the rights to intervene, what can we do? Can we do joint uh, insights and, and sense making? But games are not so good at actually knowing what the average of a particular um, uh, amount of, um, uh, how to say, um, um, the average of an amount of data is. That is something where data mining AI is much better at and simulation building, for instance. So this leads a little bit to scientific challenges. You get into systems of systems. You need to involve the human expertise much more. You get into discussions about analytical science versus design science, uh, which has been a, a discussion ongoing even in the gaming world for quite a while, particularly cl uh, Young Clubbers has been discussing this a lot. Um, you need to go outside of the university because the real world data becomes your lab. Um, and what you find is very contextual. There's no universal theory. Um, and that is difficult because in science we tr usually try to find something generalizable and universal but maybe that's not accept and maybe that's not a reasonable outcome anymore and then even for the way we design our systems yeah maybe it's not so much that we can start within the university and then have technology readiness levels and and uh, develop something that we then roll out the traditional innovation uh, pipeline we need to get out much earlier. We need to get the blue collar workers involved. You know, in healthcare, they're white, usually white coated. Um, and we need to think about like, okay, what is the reasonable level of dividing things into subsystems and, and, and aspect systems? Within this, we get, there is another way of, of visualizing actually the same thing. We have data sets. Those lead to simulations, games, AIs. And for me, those things are boundary objects. 
boundary objects, the, the things that we can all understand, where we can do sense making about, where we can have a conversation about, even though we all come from a different background. But the thing that the gaming literature doesn't talk so much about is how does, does this lead to a theory of change for real systems? And this is actually something where in the management literature, there's more done that we could connect here. Um, so if we could position simulations, games, and, and AI-based participatory methods as the intermediate boundary object here, I believe we have something to work on and that could uh, push our field also forward. These are some um, uh, uh, images from uh, Luca Marzano, one of our PhD students, um, who looked into like, okay, but how do you then do something that is evidence-driven and data-driven, uh, but still takes into account the human expertise? Um, and what he found was, okay, we actually can do the real-world data analysis, uh, but we need the the clinical knowledge domain, the doctors, to help us to even uh, choose what data uh, to get. Thereafter, he can work as a data scientist and make a data model, a pipeline. Um, but this pipeline actually needs to be informed while building it uh, by the people. And for doing that, they need to be able to play a little bit with the parameters. They need to be able to understand what a an AI pipeline is actually presenting. And then once we deliver outcomes, eh, okay, you need to, uh, we recommend that you increase the number of hospital beds with 25. That feedback needs to be validated. It needs to be interpreted. And for that, we can use games again. And if you do this, you build a pipeline, all of a sudden you get into the same type of discussions that we already have within uh, the gaming literature about the combination of analytical sciences and design sciences. Um, analytical science from left to right, whereas the design science is more like top to bottom perspective. Maybe that reminds of some of the work that I was doing like 20 years ago when trying to look at like, can we use games as the intermediate object where both of these types of sciences are, um, uh, are represented? And of course, you can chain this after another. So if we go from like, okay, this might be a perspective on what, what we need as methods, then one of the big questions becomes, in data science, we, we know very well what, let's say, the ontological and the epistemological uh, perspectives on, on reality are. They follow very much the natural science logic. But what is it then that, that is game epistemology, epistemology uh, and ontology? Can we identify a game science? Now, this is some uh, work from a paper that we just submitted to uh, simulation and gaming. I believe Toshiko <laughs> has seen it uh, now as uh, editor. Um, uh, here we worked with Jan Klabbers, Heide Lukos, uh, Marieke van Heeswijk, uh, myself, uh, all familiar names in th this forum, um, on like, can we position game science? Uh, can we reflect on the, the ph philosophical underpinnings? And um, what we try to do, because uh, if you look at the gaming literature, it's coming from all kinds of different backgrounds. So we took a guide from Moon and Blackman, uh, which explains um, uh, design sciences to natural sciences people, uh, or social sciences to natural sciences people, to engineering people. Um, it's a really nice paper. I uh, can recommend you to look it up. Um, and they came up with this table on the right-hand side, uh, where at the top level, you have the ontological level head that asks the questions like, uh, what can we actually know about? Um, then under that, you have the epistemological level. What? How do we know? How do we create knowledge? Below that, you have the theoretical uh, science perspective, uh, which is more like which philosophical orientation do you have? Is positivism, post-positivism, um, 
and well, you have all kinds of uh, uh, different ones here. Um, and we try to compare that guide to what do we observe about games. And there we came up, uh, the formatting uh, became a little bit strange. But it, what we saw was that at the ontological level, you can see that games actually only cover two of the on, uh, ontological uh, frames, um, as discussed by uh, Moon and Blackman. Games either take a critical realism or a bounded relativism uh, perspective. Um, and the differences between those are a little bit more like, do we allow people to build mental constructs, constructs in the game during the game themselves? Or do we see um, uh, their reality as more investigating uh, natural models? And what we see in the epistemological level is that there are also basically two uh, major streams that we can identify within the game science. Either they are construct uh, constructionism or constructivism. Um, and even those tend into a particular corner. What we added here was that if you look at Kahneman and um, uh, those types of all the discussions about how do we actually know that here the explicit knowing and the tacit knowing are the ones that we address within games. We do not address the um, implicit knowing. Um, we do not address the very rational data, um, uh, data driven thinking. Um, and that is then unique for games. But that also means that if we would say, like we layer games as the top part of this pyramid, that we need to address the more uh, natural sciences, analytical parts of our scientific analysis in the lower parts and do not cannot make claims about those types of things while we describe what we do with the games. So, um, the, and I also function as associate editor for, for simulation and gaming as well as, as some other um, uh, journals and outlets. And what you very often see is that people that do games, they claim all kinds of natural sciences outcomes, while that is not what was assessed within the game. That can be very often assessed in the underlying sim building of the game but not within the gaming session themselves uh, itself. It is not what the, the participants constructed as knowledge during the game. Then at the at the purposes level, what we see, and this is of course very much uh, Clubber's uh, uh, legacy, you need to make a distinction between the analytical science approach and the design science approach. You can combine those, uh, it's my own work, um, but you need to be clear about what it is, how you look at it. And then at the bottom level, like, okay, what do we actually do? We we include the social organization. We can include rules and rituals and customs, which are very difficult to include in um, AI and data, like I discussed earlier, because those things are not represented in large data sets on which we can do AI. Um, and then we have some some discussions about the practical level, like how do you do this? And that connects more to the, the regular body. Summarizing, for me, if we want to address real world problems, which we often claim we want to do with games and how good it is, then it also requires real world data analysis, not relying on fantasy models or, or theoretical models, but we need to be become better at capturing and analyzing and using modern tools on uh, data from the real world. However, um, the professional reductionism that exists within, let's say, the data science, the, da the data-driven approach at the moment, leads to very fragmented decision-making and leaves out many things that we actually do know, but ignore because we're so stuck right now uh, 
in this evidence-based data-driven approach. For me, that leads to that we need to layer methods on top of each other. Um, and here, gaming really provides other knowledge structures than the underlying data and models and simulations uh, layer. Um, but what I observe is that we, while doing, while designing games, very often throw away the complexity because AIs and, and models and simulations, they're also complex to deal with. And they're computationally heavy and they're slow and we need to, to deal with all kinds of stuff. But then we make the same mistake as the professional reductionism already does in the data-driven uh, approach. So here, I would advocate for that we need to get better at doing this. And the question to me was, please tell about what you're doing in, in uh, uh, the, the chemistry and biotechnology uh, corner. Well, what we try to do here, we have, for instance, uh, SciLife Lab and many people that are doing molecular research for new medicines, etc., uh, as well as the technology for being able to do biomolecular uh, research. Um, but the, the, let's say, more philosophical development that we have is it's not just sufficient to do AI on ACTG <laughs> simple DNA data. Um, they only have four letters, uh, as I sometimes joke. What is essential is that we are become better at capturing very diverse data and being able to relate the data from Vino's uh, smartwatch to the genomic uh, observations. And that requires bridging two worlds that are very, very different in their logic. Um, and that is a, a, well, an institutional journey, which is not always easy, but that's why I sometimes volunteer to <laughs> take management positions because I believe as ac academic leaders, we have to develop this. And if we're good at that, my hypothesis is that game science can be as rigorous as data science and natural science, and then get a place there between uh, the different sciences. So with that, I would like to stop the um, presentation and if you have any questions or discussions, I would be very happy to have those with you. Questions are invited from the panel as well as participants. You can write your questions in the question and answer tab. I have a question, please. Uh, see the health science problems which you are illustrating, like for example, uh, the aging population. Uh, we recently had a, a health science conference on this. Uh, caring for the old people in India. Um, this, uh, this uh, as you point, point out, you know, this is a global problem, different in each country. Uh, especially there are certain countries where, the, which are aging and, and, yeah. and, and few countries like India who have more angst still, enough people to look after the old people. Uh, are you working on any uh, system where, uh, you know, these days they talk about migration of population to solve this health healthcare problem? Have you come across anything like that? Uh, well, first of all, thanks. It's indeed a, a challenging uh, topic and a challenging uh, thing. Um, I'm aware of some work in uh, Europe that looks at like, can we educate uh, nurses and particular assistant nurses uh, and the nurses uh, uh, to the extent that we can do something and how do we deal with the large immigration uh, fluxes that we've seen over the past decade into Europe uh, and who are very often outside of let's say, the regular societal uh, structures. So can we do something about immigration uh, and uh, the, the lack of personnel at the same time? Um, there are already 
all kinds of things ongoing there. But at the same time, you should not ignore that people have culture, language, background. And if you're 83 year old, maybe you want to talk to someone that shares to a certain extent a, a cultural background or understands your needs, particularly once you start deteriorating, uh, especially mentally, th these types of things become important. You cannot just convert people into native Swedes or native Finns or native Japanese or <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Um, so th there have been simulations, there have been approaches to like, to what extent could we go? How do we need to think? But you also get into ethical discussions of like, it was quite popular for a while for uh, European countries to get uh, recruit people from the Philippines uh, for nursing functions. And then you get to see the newspapers that the Philippines are depleted of their nurses because the West is paying so well. That's not sustainable either. So what I'm very hesitant towards and, and maybe that connects to let's say the scientific approach that I'm, I'm uh, uh, trying to advocate is you need to have a holistic view while at the same time being able to to solve the problem that is here in front of you and for that we need methods that are not so reductionist um, and I see a lot of methods that are very very reductionist right now and with on one hand ai data science booming it seems that everyone is like oh <laughs> we go after that one uh, but forgets the, the critical thinking with it um, i hope that answered your question yeah uh, just one more question uh, you were talking about the atcg data and the proteomics data yeah. uh, genomic data uh, right now, uh, this data uh, is uh, uh, available only in a few countries, right? Because uh, in, in countries like ours, where with a very vast population, it's, um, uh, it's quite, uh, quite an amount of work to have that kind of uh, data for everyone. Yeah. Uh, and also, it's very expensive uh, to analyze uh, to make the genomic or proteomic analysis. Uh, how do you look at this? Uh, that uh, maybe this is possible only in two countries. I, I don't know. Um, if, if you look at the whole genome sequencing, the costs have been going down for the past 10 years and are predicted to go down by the same factor. Um, I know just here in Stockholm, um, there are large sequencing facilities just empty because we bought a lot of those when a certain virus went around the world. Um, and now people are wondering, like, what should we do with it? So at the moment, actually, there's an overcapacity of, of uh, uh, genome sequencing uh, in the world. It's still, of course, expensive to use. On the other hand, there seems to be a, a technocratic belief in if we know everyone's genome, we have answers to all the questions. Um, and But if I talk with the really good people, they say like, ah, no, because be before it gets into uh, proteins and before you also involve everything that that goes on in your guts and and all of that there are so many factors already going into play and you get into this discussion about 10 years ago mit had this advertisement where they said like give us your dna and uh, and we'll predict whether your child will uh, go to an ivy league university and then some social scientist says, we can already do that. Uh, just give us your postal code. Um, and that is, that is one that I always remembered because we can do all kinds of very advanced stuff for things where we already know the pattern. And maybe we understand better 
how this mechanism actually works. And of course, there might be genetic factors. But sometimes causality, um, causation, and uh, we don't do not need to know all the parts of the causation if we have a good correlation. And that might be good enough. And that connects a little bit to Elizabeth's uh, 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 questions in the chat. Like, what is good enough? For a scientist will always say, like, I want to know more about this particular thing. But I observe lots of money in science going to going from 98% reliability to 99% reliability, whereas the question next to it doesn't get any attention at all. And well, that that is, I believe, a a threat to the sustainability of the scientific effort uh, globally. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Will you please ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. hello, Sebastian. Thank you for a brilliant lecture. I'm uh, astonished. I will surely, I have learned a lot and I will use some of your beautiful uh, conceptual Sessions. I'm from. I'm based in Finland, so I'm very familiar with the Swedish. I've studied in Sweden, so <clears throat> yes. Uh, the the basic question you started with was the decision making. That uh, you you asked why do smart people make stupid decisions, and uh, <clears throat> I would like to. Perhaps you have you already gave some ideas of why that is but i would like to maybe challenge this with a question that uh, are are these not problems of professional role design that if one professional role is static or non-dynamic then it forces the decision maker maybe a scientist or a politician to stick to that role because fear of losing the role or something like that. So the system, if it's externally creating roles that are driven internally, then uh, the decision-making decision will always suffer. I believe you're, you're right. But the, then my question becomes, how are those roles designed? And there, I believe that even our education system is split up along exactly the same lines as the professional roles. Um, and I believe SVPV also has industrial advisory boards where you have professionals that have been educated that come back to ask for more of what they've been educated in um, than uh, with an industrial perspective 20 years later. Um, it is almost one of my former supervisors was Gertjan Hofstede uh, from the, the Sun Culture Theories, and he was into artificial sociality, as, as he calls it. Uh, last week, he had his farewell speech, um, and he was very clear about how you can uh, articulate the, the tendency of people to form groups and what is important in groups. And those things that are important for groups and, and subgroups to, to form are not things that are, let's say, rationally, scientifically arguable, important to the specific uh, field that has to do with how humans function. Um, and what we tend to do is to argue a lot of content for, uh, I used to work in, in, in uh, transport for quite a while. Um, um, and in the transport world, for instance, you have the people that do road engineering and you have the people that do railway engineering and they don't talk to each other because they have a different belief system. Are their methods relevant to each other? Yes, of course. But most of the groups that I know in the world where they have merged road engineering and railway engineering are still two groups just with one leader. <laughs> um, 
because these these communities are so strong is that rational no but it's how the social the the this the social dynamics work maybe we need to we need to become better instead of calling this for like a failure in design of roles as a failure of not addressing those things that that make us human in the design of the more rational professional world yeah so some kind of human centered design of roles yeah or, yeah or the the fact that we're social animals in the end we're all apes <laughs> even here um uh but within that we need we need to to use how we are programmed as humans in the way we design the world and we tend to say like yeah but i have a better differential equation fantastic good good luck with your better differential equation um but how will this spread what is the group that will accept that differential equation and how do you, how do you take into account what it will be used for um, and th those are different types of questions that we very often not ask and I, I work at technical universities because of my belief that a lot of the technical inventions are are very good but also because that actually provides for a very interesting domain for people like me who are also interested in the human logic and the human design um, you cannot do that without the technology that needs to be integrated yeah so it, practically using the design science also in designing roles yes yes very much yeah thank you beautiful answer um miss elizabeth Lee have a few questions so ma'am uh could i read or would you like to read Maybe your uh, mic is not. Elizabeth, you're muted. You are muted. Quite right. I forgot that. Um. So when I was listening to you, what what really struck me was that if we deal with data that's in some of the ways you're suggesting, the time to collect it and then analyze it will be extremely long. That the methods that are currently in use are shortcuts. And I'm just wondering, you know, how how will we deal with that time factor if we do get to collect that data that we really need? Um, and and then I guess, yeah, go on. Yeah. The, uh, you, you have a very important point here. Um. At the same time, I would argue that um, there's a there's a it's it's well noted already since two thousand and five. Uh, Swartz uh, like uh, the the um, analysis uh, paralysis. Uh, we have so much data; it's very difficult to to take any decision at all because we always want to improve. And there, of course, this it needs to be good enough is mm. important. But what I observe is that the good enough leads to these reductionist steps of yes. moving towards the average, looking at the easier data where we have a lot of data, mm -hmm. where it's easy, easy to get good quality data. And that in itself builds in biases that are not yes. offset by other methods. I, I agree. I, I Further down in the chat, I put... I, I, I am a statistical anomaly. In Australia, we have a big advertising campaign that says seatbelts save lives. I've been in two serious car accidents. If I'd had a seatbelt on in either one, and the, the police have told me this, if I'd had a seatbelt on, the accident would have killed me. So I am not one of the people for whom seatbelts save lives. I wear one now because it's compulsory, but I'm just... I'm really curious as to how does you know good data take account of 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 you know those outliers, the statistical anomalies, the things that are 
that don't fall into the average of and I'm not necessarily asking you to to answer that question. Well, I think you're really what you're doing is is raising those as as genuinely valid issues yes. that I think we aren't paying nearly enough attention to. Well, thanks, and that's indeed what I want. And and if I look at my own uh, work and, and practice, I doubt every day. I doubt every slide that I presented today, <laughs> um, but but being comfortable with that doubt um, is maybe a skill that yes. is preferable. Um, but that that doubt does not exist in a rational, data driven, uh, evidence based. Uh, logic well, because we need to know it, it drives out doubt and yet yes. doubt is what we need yes i agree this has been amazing thank you cool. thank you man uh Vinosa, please ask your question uh, Sebas, thank you for a very good presentation uh yeah. i have a question i have an answer and i have an observation i start with observation first. I'll avoid the answer. We'll discuss it later. Observation is that uh, I'm glad to see Harsh as part of a team. I met him uh, twice in Bangalore. He's very, very sharp and fast. And I'm glad to see that he has made some of those graphics, uh, which I saw today. Uh, please say hi to him from my side. The question I have is uh, uh, this. With smartwatches and uh, more medicinal uh, technologies or medical technologies on the way, AI included, are we headed to a situation where the patient will most likely self-diagnose, self-diagnose, self-prescribe, and what would they say? Preacher, heal yourself. Will we, somewhere in the future, 2030, be able to walk into a booth and uh, get a root canal surgery done? 2030. Um, let me reformulate that question. Uh, as what is the role of doctors and hospitals when a lot of the diagnosis can be done by AI and data that is collected around you? Um, the things that AI are not so good at is at contextual information. So mm -hmm. AI is very good at analyzing a picture of some form of edema or whatever you have on your skin, comparing that to 100,000 other photos of your skin uh, or other skins, and then saying like, okay, you need to see a doctor or not. But systemic issues, understanding the body as a system, understanding social behavior, understanding values, what is important to this patient and what is important to another patient. Those are things for which this, this self-management and AI-supported um, future, that will be very, very difficult. And it's even questionable whether that is desirable and whether that will be, it, it requires such good amounts of high quality data. Um, it requires ethical perspectives on how we model. So 2030, absolutely not. Um, will it be the case that I should send in the data about my smartwatch, smartwatch uh, from my smartwatch to the hospital so that they have an opinion about me before I arrive? That might be the case. Or actually what we see right now happening is that certain patients that are in a risk zone, they are permanently monitored by some AI system that is coupled to a nurse or a doctor somewhere watching them. So the relation with the hospital will change. And 
the knowledge in the hospital about you will change. But the doctor will still need to take a decision, um, maybe AI assisted, AI informed. But relying on what the doctor is responsible for, on these methods that can do recognition of images and, and other patterns, I believe that will be a very, very large step. But in the year 2030 or 35, You're will, I to go, <laughs> will I need to go to a hospital to get my uh, tooth removed? Or can I go into a booth next door and get it done? Or maybe at home? It's a, it's a good question. I believe more and more things that are not acute surgery will move to the home. We see that happening over here already. Um, you need to make a distinction between uh, what is the value of hospitals? Well, if, if we take out your tooth, if everything goes well, it's a routine thing and you walk out. If it goes wrong in those 2% of cases, then you actually need suddenly need the full hospital apparatus in the background. So that is why a dentist doesn't do certain types of things. It's not because they're not capable of doing it, but it's because it needs to be done in a hospital where if it goes wrong, there are other things in place to help you. And again, there what you're what you're pointing at is the reductionist of reductionism on the actual thing that needs to be done, which maybe is possible at many other places. And the outlier cases where things maybe suddenly need to sh shift into another system. And then the physical proximity of all the, the doctors in one place and sterile places, et cetera, et cetera, all of a sudden become important. I have an answer to your question. Why do stupid or smart people make stupid mistakes? But it will take about <laughs> half an hour for our discussions alone. So I will not uh, open it up here, maybe on some other day, on some other seminar, webinar. Thank you, Sebas. Thank you for the discussion. And remind uh, Harish about me. Harish about Thank me. Thank you. Thank you. I think all the questions are over. And uh... Thank you, Professor Sebastian, for the thought-provoking and insightful session on the very interesting topic in trend. I would like to extend our gratitude to Professor Sebastian for his valuable insights. And now let's invite Dr. Jigyasu Dubey, the coordinator of Center of Excellence in Simulation and Gaming, for the words of this. Thank you, Rupali. At the outset, our, we express our sincere gratitude to Professor Sebastian Major, Professor and Vice Dean, KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, for accepting our invitation to conduct this 56th webinar of the series, Pratiti Becoming Aware. Thank you very much for such an uh, exciting session. We are also thankful to the International Simulation and Gaming Association, Is ISAGA, for their support. We express our sincere gratitude to Dr. Pindar Dhar, Vice Chancellor, and Dr. Santosh Dhar, Rector and Dean of the University, for their continuous guidance and encouragement. We are also thankful to Dr. Guru Prasad for gracing the event. Our sincere thanks to today's panelists, Dr. Elizabeth Leek, Dr. Toshiko, Eric, Dr. Vinod Damlekar, Vile, and all other panelists and all the participants who make this webinar successful. I am also thankful to Dr. Rupali Bharti and all the members of Center of Excellence in Simulation Gaming as Triple as well as Team IT of the University for their kind support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all uh, for joining us today. And we hope uh, this session uh, find enriching and inspiring. And I request all the participants to please fill the feedback form as mentioned in the chat box for getting e-certificates. Thank you. Stay tuned for more exciting webinars on gaming and simulation in the Prakriti 2024. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Sebas. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Thank Sebas.
Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, Eric Cantochukov, for being here. Yeah, thank you.